Welcome. Hi, I'm Judy. Today's topic is how to shift from your negative body image to a positive body image. And I've got three amazing body confidence coaches with me who are going to give their stories and also some really awesome tips. Next, we have Erica. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Erica, let me put you on the full screen there for a second yes. while I Hello. read your, your bio. Um, I love that Erica is an anti-diet advocate and a radical self-love coach. And she works to help clients deprogram themselves from the diet culture. Oh my gosh. Improve mm -hmm. body image and live from a place of true self-acceptance. Former hairstylist, obviously, <laughs> beautifully. And Erica has been working with women for, for 20 years. Um, she says to embrace their raw beauty and improve their confidence. And I love that you say this. Her clients describe her as a gentle badass <laughs> yep. who oozes love and compassion, but not afraid to speak up or disrupt mm -hmm. the status quo. Mm -hmm. She's dedicated to helping women and pursues this mission with conviction and passion. Love to hear your story, Erica. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This was like, like the perfect example of how the universe just kind of brings people together because Melissa who connected us yes. is somebody that I met in my Facebook group and she, speaking on vulnerability, very vulnerably reached out to me to apologize for some comments she made in my group that didn't go over so well. And now we formed like a really close bond and that's how Judy and I got connected. So the power of vulnerability is real. Yeah. Um, but yes, my name is Erica Beal and I am a radical self-love coach, anti-diet advocate and mom of two. And I will say that my big like, oh my gosh, what am I doing with my life came when I had my daughter because I had spent my entire life on and off diets, painfully shy. Like I was the kid that would not raise their hand in school, not because I didn't know the answer. I'm actually very intelligent and did very well in school, but I didn't want people to look at me. I was just horribly uncomfortable in my skin. I can remember my first diet being in middle school and my eighth grade graduation is like marked with this big accomplishment that I thought I had made after having some dental surgery done and losing weight. I was excited in eighth grade that I got to buy smaller clothes because I had been on a liquid diet. That is how invasive diet culture is and these messages that we get that we need to essentially shrink our bodies to be healthy, to be worthy, to be beautiful. So I spent my adolescence just like spiraling in self-loathing, hating my body, disrespecting my body. Um, after I graduated high school, I found myself just like not sure what to do to love myself. I had pursued a career in hairdressing. It was like the only thing I wanted to do, despite nobody in my family wanting me to do it. Um, I was supposed to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, but I did it anyways. Um, but then I spent 10 years connecting with women on such a deep level. And I was the, the stylist at the salon that was like, I want to talk about like what excites you and what lights you up, not how to make you look younger. And for me, it was a tough period in my life because here I was un horribly uncomfortable in my own skin in front of a mirror day in and day out, listening to conversations about Botox and um, plastic surgery and how to look younger and covering gray hair. And I mean, the back room of the hair salon was constant diet talk and food shaming and talking about going to the gym. And when you didn't, you'd feel guilty. And it consumed me. I um, left that career when I got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And that was like the height of my like body hate. I had suffered a miscarriage about a year prior. I went on this huge journey trying to figure out why I was in so much pain in my joints that doctors wrote off as, oh, you do hair, of course. But I knew something wasn't right. But it all came to a head when I got this diagnosis and I couldn't handle the pain anymore. 
and I left for my career. And then three months later, I got pregnant with my first child, my daughter. And the discomfort in my body was at an all time high, not just the physical discomfort, the weight gain for somebody who had spent their entire life, like actively working really hard not to gain weight because we're told that's the worst possible thing you can do. Being pregnant just amplified it. And I honestly hated every minute of it. And I swore I wouldn't have any more kids. And it was because I didn't want to gain weight again. And after I had my daughter, I slipped into a pretty deep depression and anxiety postpartum, um, felt really lost. Like I couldn't carry on a conversation with anybody. Like I had nothing like, who am I to the extreme? Because I had left my career and I found myself home with this baby and not knowing what to do. Hating myself, stressed out, um, really disconnected. And I looked at my daughter one day. She was about eight months old. I was borderline obsessive with what I was feeding her because I had said, like, before I had kids, they're not going to have my messed up relationship with food. Like, that it was not going to happen. I didn't even think about my body, but with food. So I was obsessive with making sure she was only eating like organic homemade food. And meanwhile, I was just spiraling farther and farther into like the abyss of who am I? What am I doing? And it hit me in that moment. I was like, she's not going to be a baby forever. Like I need to set an example for her. Um, She's going to start asking me questions. How can I expect her you know, to live this empowered life if I didn't even know what that meant. So I decided like something's got to give. And I was just open and curious. And I decided to like stop worrying about my weight and to stop going on diets. And I had no idea that that was going to open me up into like this huge, massive world of opportunity because the mental real estate that was taken up by counting calories, counting points, Um, Going to the gym two hours a day, six days a week before kids, pretending that I liked it, fighting through the pain um, and all of the the feelings of just like self-hate that took up a lot of brain space. And when I finally broke through all of that, it was like, oh, my God, I can do anything. I can do anything like I have important things to say and life is exciting. And I'm not just a mom who hates her body. Um. And then when I got pregnant with my son, who's now, he's 16 months, it all kind of came to a head because in the midst of that first kind of aha and transformation where I thought that I was making peace with food and my body, in reality, I had lost weight in that transition after having my daughter. And that's why I was so comfortable in my skin because I was finally the size that I had spent so long trying to be. Meanwhile, I was not allowing myself to eat after 7 p.m. I was not buying certain foods because I was afraid to eat them. Um, I was terrified when I found out I was pregnant. I was like, oh no, here we go again. I'm going to gain weight. But I tried telling myself like, oh, it's going to be different this time because I am eating better. I gained weight. I gained the same amount of weight. But the difference was at the beginning of that pregnancy, I decided I wasn't going to focus on it and I wasn't going to care about it. And the scale exited my life. Um, I switched doctors because one of them commented on my weight gain. And I'm like, this is really, really unproductive because the messages that we receive all day, every day, right? Um, Are that we need to lose weight. That's the key to health and happiness. So you might think like one message here or there isn't a big deal, but diet culture is just that. It is woven into the fabric of our society. Messages of thinness being the ultimate goal that you have to strive for which in turn oppresses and shames people in larger bodies. So it's this whole idea that we need to lose weight that is keeping people trapped and stuck on this cycle of self-loathing because diets don't work, right? When we, when we actively and intentionally lose weight, oftentimes restriction is involved, right? When you go on a diet, you are restricting in some way, shape, or form whether it's cutting calories, intermittent fasting, 
cutting out food groups, whatever the food group of the moment is that we're supposed to be scared of, right? We're restricting. And when you restrict, it sends the message to your body that like, oh my gosh, there's a famine, right? There's not enough food. When am I going to ever get food? Because we're wired to survive. Our bodies are really, really smart. So if we're not feeding it what it needs because we're trying to lose weight, it goes into like survival mode, right? Which shut, shuts down, you know, major systems and functions like digestion and um, your reproduction system. Like, because now you're preserving your energy because you're in a famine, it's a crisis and your body's on high alert. So what does that do? It keeps you hyper-focused on food because your body's like, oh, I need it, I need it. So while you think you have a problem controlling binge eating, chances are it's restriction that's the actual problem that's keeping you so focused on food that when you actually get it, you can't stop eating it. Or the language around um, emotional eating and how it's bad. Like we're all emotional eaters. Every human is an emotional eater because food does bring emotion. It does calm the nervous system. It brings joy, it brings pleasure. But we're so programmed to believe that we need to fear food, right? With using language like good, bad food, that puts a moral value on the food. So when you're eating said bad food, you are now thinking, I'm a bad person because that's the message you're getting. Even talking about clean food, that implies that other food is dirty, right? And if you're eating it, you're bad, you're wrong. If you're constantly telling your that, it just matters your self esteem, right? Every time you eat a piece of birthday cake, like what is life without birthday cake, right? To bring us joy, food should be pleasurable. But diet culture takes us so far away from that and so far away from our own self trust. We think we can't trust ourselves, whether it be around food or to take care of ourselves. And you think that like, oh my gosh, my body changed. I gained weight. I had a baby. I need to bounce back. There are who have babies and within like the first couple of months when they should just be resting and recovering and tending to their baby and themselves are more focused on trying to bounce back and lose the weight because that's what we're told we need to do. And that's how I felt you know, after I had my daughter and I felt like I didn't want people to look like I let myself go, which is why I choose not to wear makeup. And I very purposely don't wear makeup. Anytime I do a live, anytime I do anything like this, like I shared with everybody before that I didn't shower today and I'm not like going to not show up because I have two kids and the shower just didn't happen. Right. Because I've done the work to separate myself from these really, really messed up beauty standards that have women especially spending all of their time and their energy and their resources chasing this ideal right taking us away from our true essence and who we truly are making us afraid to be seen and to be heard right literally keeping us small in the pursuit of shrinking your body when we know that 98 percent of people who lose weight on diets will gain the weight back and then some so all of these rounds of restriction then lead you to gain more weight over time and your weight set point gets higher. So when you go to the doctor and they're like, well, you've gained weight and they send you home with a prescription for weight loss, it's keeping you trapped in that cycle, right? We need to get to the root of the body shame and the trauma. Like we all carry trauma and we carry a lot of trauma around our experiences with our body and our body image. And, um, that stays with us and permeates into all areas of our lives. So in the work that I do, we work to like really get to the root of that body shame and come to a place of radical self-acceptance, which means no matter what, if you are not even just with like your size and your, your body, but like when you're going through something, when you are feeling low, when you're angry, when you're sad, all of the feelings, we honor them and we celebrate them and we accept them instead of trying to hide it and pretend like, you know, we're perfect and we fit into this box of perfection and like we have it all together. Like life is messy. And when you get to that place of radical self-acceptance, you don't let that messiness stop you. And you begin to see past your body. And what's really important, I'll get into my tips now. Um, really, really easy things you can do to start right now, improving your body image and the way you view yourself. 
If you're on social media for any length of time, which if you're here watching this right now, I'm assuming you are, be really intentional about your newsfeed and curate it. There are accounts, especially on Instagram, Instagram's a great place to be in the body positivity world. There are accounts where there are people are showing bodies of all different shapes, sizes, colors, and abilities. You need to diversify, right? What you see. Because right now, the mainstream, what we see is the ideal body. A thin white body is the ideal body that you see everywhere, right? So if we start exposing ourselves to bodies that maybe look like ours or that don't fit that standard, you start to feel less like something's wrong with you. When you start to see the diversity of bodies and celebrate them and see the beauty in them, it allows you to then turn in and be like, okay, all right, maybe I can see the beauty in myself too. Instead of that one visual, right, that we all have of what we should look like and how we should act. Um, so that's like number one. And unfollow pages and people and um, accounts that make you feel bad about yourself, right? A lot of the fitspo and the um, fitness pages, be really careful and intentional. When we see before and after pictures, not only is it triggering for people, but you're looking at a before picture. If you identify with that before picture, you immediately now think something's wrong with me because the before picture is the bad one, right? And I want to look like the after. I used to call myself a before, right? It's very harmful. <laughs> All of these pages and these people that are feeding you the message that you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight. Because health is a whole hell of a lot more than weight. And if you're living in this place of body hate and shame and self-loathing, it doesn't matter how much weight you lose. Your health is still not going to be what you're hoping for, right? Until we address the deeper stuff. That's, and so, that's so true, Erica. That is so true. Um, I worked in OB um, and ovarian cancer research for many years. And... Uh, the women were giving it all away, trying to do all these things that you're talking about, but giving all their energy away mm -hmm. and got sick. Mm -hmm. So you have about two minutes um, yeah. to okay. finish the tip, your beautiful tips and, and any uh, link you have to share. Yes. One more. No, two more tips. Three more tips. I'll make them quick. Lose the scale, right? It's really probably not helping you with anything. You get on the scale, it puts you in a bad mood. It affects the rest of your day. You don't need it. Get rid of it. Wear clothes that fit the body you have right now. It's going to take work if it's a bigger size and that makes you uncomfortable. But to physically feel good in your clothes as opposed to wearing clothes that are too tight or uncomfortable, you're going to be thinking about your body all day long if your pants are too tight, right? So wear clothes that feel physically feel really good on your body and stop avoiding the mirror. Start to befriend it, right? Look at yourself with no judgment intentionally look at yourself with no judgment and look at all of you and start um, looking at sides of you and angles of you that you've otherwise like been afraid to look at or ashamed of. Bring them to light, have compassion, kindness for yourself. Um, so two ways to work with me. I have a few spots open for one-on-one -on -one high level coaching where we will work together for six months. And it's so much more than just body image. It's really coming back to self-trust, to deepening into your intuition, to realizing that there is a whole world of opportunity for you and that you have so much magic living inside of you. I help you uncover it and get to the root of all of that and you know, work on exploring and healing trauma and body shame so you can truly come to this place of radical self-acceptance. And I also have a four-week digital course that's all self-paced. It's for 30-minute videos, really digestible, really easy. I like to keep things super simple. Um, there's also a private Facebook group that goes along with it where you get to practice being vulnerable and being visible and being seen, supported, and loved. Because when we feel supported, seen, heard, and loved, everything changes, right? So that's a four-week course. It's $197. I'll leave the link for it. It's super impactful and has been changing lives already. So thank you so much for having me. I hope you all find some of these tips helpful. I'll say, <laughs> wow, those are <laughs> incredibly valuable tips. I have a, a, a comment here. 
for both Theo and Erica, I really like the focus on internal value mm -hmm. going inside. So thank you both. Mm -hmm.